in Utah's enabling act, it says forever disclaim all right and title until title thereto shall have been extinguished. So dispose and extinguish means get rid of title. A subset of that, a subset of that is sell. If you sell by the agreement, you pay 5% of the proceeds to the state. That started from Ohio all the way through, including Oregon. If you sell, 5% of the proceeds go to the state. All of the ones except Nevada is to support the schools. 5% of the proceeds of the sale of public lands which shall be sold, shall be paid to the state to support the schools. Why would we then extract that from the Enabling Act and say, don't ever bother to dispose of it? It doesn't make any sense, right? It doesn't make any sense at all because it doesn't make any sense. Right? It doesn't make sense. So, does that, is that promises are the same, right? Their promises are the same on both sides. There are two different types of enabling acts. I actually think your argument's even stronger than ours. Because that, that shall not interfere with the primary disposal. Yours ties right into the 1784 land ordinance. You can trace it directly to 1780. It's right in the Northwest Ordinance, which is the very reason that you have Article 4 in the Constitution. Ours, they changed the language on some other states and used that forever disclaim all right and time. It means the same thing. In fact, there's a 1915 Supreme Court case where they went through this and said those enabling acts all mean the same thing. It means they're supposed to dispose of the land. So uh, the case is a, a Washington, it's a U.S. Supreme Court case out of Washington, Christiansen versus King County. Um, that's one that we want to look at and go through. But they go back and they list all the enabling acts and say these are the same thing. So here, so here you've got on this card right here, this is, this, is the, this is the argument to the people you're going to talk to in, in 10 seconds, uh, in terms of why. Why does it matter? Federally controlled lands, wildfires more than 250 acres. Notice the difference? I'm sure that's a coincidence. Wow. Right? Wow. Wow. Right? And, then, and then this one, this is... Mineral value more than $150 trillion locked up in federal controlled land. That's gross mismanagement. And they talk about how they thin the trees and they thin the understory and they manage the, the, the forest. They tended the garden. And guess what? They got revenue while they were doing that and had a healthier forest. But the national forest, gone, including the spotted owl habitat, including millions of animals, including watershed that's now devastated for decades, if not generations. Their recreation industry, decimated in that area. That led them to do some other really cool things. But this is, uh, this is fires. No, it's all land grabs. Millions of acres burned. This comes out of the, uh, the uh, National Interagency Fire Center. Millions of acres burned. Boy, see that? More trees, more fuel, more fire. So why, why look at this? <coughs> it's the only solution big enough to protect the environment. Protect the wildlife. I mean, millions. I mean, we, don't, we don't show these kinds of pictures. We need to start doing this. Yep. In fact, you can find photos of, I mean, I've got photos of eagles burned, photos of, 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 of uh, bighorn sheep burned by the hundreds. That's horrible. I mean, this is happening all over. We need to start using this information to start bringing the people in that, that, that understand. The eco-obstructionists, you know, they're never coming because they make money litigating. Yep. It's a litigation mill. Right. But the others that consider themselves true environmentalists, not the eco-obstructionists, Come on, this is this is this is a, this is a road we can all walk down together. That's right. Uh, multiple use access. Um, anybody have roads being shut down in their counties? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Locked off, shut down, and yet that's passing for environmentalism. It's not. We're losing access all over the West. This is happening yep. in every county. I've been all over the West except for Alaska so far. I'm going there in a couple months. Same thing is happening. Access is being shut off. Every Forest Service plan, every BLM plan on travel management is closing roads all over the West. And then now you have no fire breaks, you have no evacuation routes. Um, you know, sheriff and, and commissioner, they were, they were telling us about you know, trying to go out and do search and rescue and the gates are locked, you can't even go out. When you're going out to try to help, you can't even get to them because they're locked off. Um, the economy. I'll show you some more things on that. But 150 trillion locked up. You've got, you know, the the, the, the timber issues, the resource issues, um, and then just, quite frankly, the stewardship. People will say, this is what you'll hear. Well, if it came to the state, you would just sell off all the lands. You would just sell them all off. <laughs> well, because at step one, you have to deal with all those vested interests. If you were in 1859, absolutely, sell them all off. That was the deal. 
We're not in 1859. We're not in 1896 for Utah. And over that period of time, we've relied to our detriment, it's a legal term, on those lands being public land. You have businesses built around them. You have community funding built around that. So you have to honor that for now and then figure out the transition. So you carry those rights over status quo. Federal public lands become state public lands for multiple use, sustained yield with local planning until you can sort through that transition. Right? If you try to go the next step, you're going to lose, every, you're going to lose everything along the way because people's lives and businesses have been built on that principle. So this is Oregon, okay? Going off of what Dennis was saying. This is Oregon. Out of a $25.4 billion in annual revenue, 45.4% of that comes from a federal government that is admittedly broke. With no backup plan. Where do you go? Now in Utah, we've started to build some things, uh, federal receipts reporting requirements, federal funds uh, review commission, to start looking at our backup plan. And here's what's cool, I've got my Utah Association of, of, of CPAs, I've got other groups in this Federal Funds Review Commission on how we do our contingency planning, saying, hey, you know, the only solution is to grow the base, and the only real way to grow, to grow the base is to transfer the lands. Right? I've got nonpartisan groups working on this thing. The only way we're ever going to close that gap, is in Utah, our gap is about 40%. The only way you close that gap is to expand the base. The only way you expand the base is to honor the promise. Right? These, are, these are not partisan issues. Right? You've got opportunities to work these things. So as Dennis mentioned, right, this is, uh, that's the trend. It's not slowing down. It's, it's accelerating as it will. And uh, you know, this is what passes for uh, political management of our lands now. National parks were deemed, so when they say, oh, you can't manage your own lands, you and the states can't manage your own lands, in Utah, I don't know what it is for Oregon, but in Utah, that's an $8 billion industry, tourism, on our national parks, shut down overnight. Mountains, wow. closed. The oceans, closed. Jeez. National parks, closed. Deemed non-essential. Yep. Yep. Deemed non-essential. These are, these are revenue generating opportunities deemed non-essential and, and, and shut down entire communities overnight in Utah. I'm sure it was the same thing here. And then this is, of course, you know, the, uh, the, the pennies in lieu of trillions. Now this is the video that Dennis alluded to. I want you to see this Murkowski video. This is going to astound you based on what we've been talking about here for, for the last little bit. The community of Wrangell, where I went to elementary school, is a community where 64% of, of their uh, budget for the school comes from secure rural schools funding. Um, when they don't know where 64% of their budget is going to be coming from on a year-to-year on -year basis, it causes a great deal of stress. The PILT program, of course, is permanent, so we're not concerned about the program expiring, but what we are concerned about is the level uh, at which the program is funded. PILT was created in 1976 by Congress because we changed our federal land policy from one that was focused on disposal to one that was focused on retention. Mm -hmm. These payments are literally payments in lieu of taxes to compensate our local governments for the loss in tax revenue caused by this change in policy. Secure Rural Schools, unlike PILT, was largely a replacement program for the receipt sharing programs, whether it's the Forest Service payments to states and the Bureau of Management. Oregon and California have for their payments. These payments uh, made under these programs were historically from receipts generated by timber sales for roads and school purposes. But I think we, we recognize that they were never intended to be a permanent entitlement program, but more specifically a temporary uh, short-term bridge to allow the communities to transition to the new economic reality that was forced upon them by environmental policies that were designed to, to halt timber harvesting. Mm -hmm. But if you were a community like Ketchikan, where I was born down in southeast Alaska, Ketchikan, their private taxable lands within the Ketchikan Gateway Borough are 0.3%. 0.3%. So if, if you have no other place to go, if 96.5% of the percent of the land in your borough is held by the federal government, the state has 1.3%, the local government has 0.3%, there is 0.3% that is taxable land. So when you say you've got this federal policy that says you can't harvest within the Tongass because 
we're just saying you can't harvest in the Tongass. And you have no place to go for your tax base. And we say, well, this is just going to be a temporary program for you until you can transition. The question is, what do you transition to? But I think we all know, I mean, we're, we're having budget conversations this week. It's, it's on everybody's mind. Federal government, um, federal government's broke here. We can't continue to pay counties to not utilize the lands within their boundaries. And Mr. Chairman, you have, have appropriately suggested where we need to go with this. They, you need to be able to, to access the resources that are on your lands. We either need to use, utilize our federal lands to generate the revenue and the jobs for our rural communities, or we should divest the federal government of those lands and let the states or the counties, the boroughs, manage them. Yep. They know what the solution is. Yeah. It's just going to take political help to get them there. Right? It's going to take that hiring and inspiring leaders and, and action to move things that direction. I mean, we can't afford to keep paying counties to not utilize the lands and resources within their boundaries. Right? I mean, that should be no surprise to anyone. So from the time that she made this video, she said, well, Pilt is permanent, so we're not, we're not worried about that expiring what yeah. happened earlier this year. Right. Right? They haven't had a budget for five years, but in the omnibus spending bill, Pilt, that was supposed to be permanent, mandatory, perpetual, was not in the omnibus spending bill. It got in the farm bill for one year so that they could buy $40 billion in food stamps for five years for one year of Pilt. You see, it's just a bargaining chip now yeah. so that they can get Western legislators that have to come home with that money to bargain for more spending of money we don't have. That's where this is at. I mean, in 1976, when they did PILT, they said, look, we know that the ability to tax the land, because again, remember PILT, payment in lieu of the taxes that you would otherwise collect if we kept our promise. <laughs> That's what PILT is, payment in lieu of the taxes you would otherwise collect if we kept our promise. They said, we're going to give you this pill, it's, it's just as good as sovereignty. It's just as good. It's going to be permanent. It's going to be mandatory until it's not. And guess what? It's not. Right? So this, this is a study that just came out of Nevada in April. Nevada is another. So five states have now passed legislation to start working on the logistics of transferring the public lands. Utah led in 2012. You've got Idaho. Nevada, Wyoming, Montana, Utah, Arizona just did some appropriations to work on the logistics, and South Carolina passed a resolution supporting the transfer. I'll show you that in a second. Nevada just did an economic analysis that came out in April. Here's some of the things that came out of it. They said they studied all the states around them that have public lands, uh, BLM-type lands, and they showed those different states. They showed the acreage, you know, Arizona 9.3 million, uh, Utah 3.5 million. Uh, New Mexico and whatnot, and then this is the revenue that the states generate. Now get this, because people will say, oh, you can't manage your own lands. You, I, had, I had the Clinton BLM director, we had a debate a couple weeks ago, some of you probably saw that. We had the debate, you states can't handle the complexity of managing your own lands. <laughs> Look at this, okay, in terms of handling the complexity. Arizona, $23 an acre positive net revenue. Idaho, 16, New Mexico, 57, Utah, $33 an acre positive net revenue. BLM, loses 91 cents an acre. Oh. Nevada then found that, that if they took the BLM late acres, just the BLM, not the Forest Service, that's what they were looking at in their study, potential $1.5 billion a year positive net revenue wow. to the state. We can't afford not to. Environmentally, economically, we can't afford not to. And again, that's Nevada where you can barely grow a sagebrush. Imagine if you had Oregon. Oh, wow. Right? Mm -hmm. So, speaking of Oregon, um, this is from a book called Who's Minding the Federal Estate, done in 2009 by the Property and Environmental Research Center out of Bozeman, Montana. Federal ONC lands, um, expenses exceed revenues. Now, I didn't go to business school. <laughs> I went to law school, but I understand you've got over here Oregon. Revenues exceed expenses. I understand that's the way it's supposed to work. But look again, here you've got, on timber, generally, throughout the western states, for every dollar the federal government spends, it doesn't get a dollar back. For every dollar the states spend, $5.61. And yet, some will claim you can't manage, handle the complexity of managing your own land. Recreation. Because that's what some people will say, well, recreation is what it's really all about. 
on recreation, the federal government doesn't get even close to the dollar that it spends back. States get nearly $10 back for every dollar it spends on recreation, on the public lands that states already manage. Uh, grazing, federal government doesn't even come close to getting its dollar back. States generate positive <laughs> revenue. Some people will say, well, okay, if I'm a rancher, then this is going to be bad for me because I'm going to pay more. If you're a rancher, you're losing AUMs and they're never coming back. Animal unit months, right? They're never coming back. You have no certainty. You can't get out and, and manage your spring boxes and your water. You can't even get to it. And if you're in New Mexico, your water is now being fenced off and you can't, it's just gone. Your water, private property water rights are being fenced off by the Forest Service and gone. Yep. Right? So when is, you know, sometimes you get what you pay for. Uh, the state, yeah, you may be paying more, but and our ranchers in Utah, as we looked at this and they worked through this, said, no, we'd happily pay more for the certainty and the service and the ability to, to get on. If you're a rancher now and you want to improve your water on your allotments, you've got to go through the whole EIS and your years down the road before you can even get in to improve, improve the water. What's, that ha what's happening on your, on your time cost of money in doing that? Mineral extraction. Now, in mineral extraction, this is where the federal government does generate some positive net revenue but the states only do about nine times more, <laughs> right? We can't afford not to. This is uh, general land management, revenue per dollar spent, just kind of recaps the others. Um, state outperform the feds. This is uh, revenue per employee. States, half a million dollars per employee. Federal government, substantially less. This is out of the uh, uh, Congressional Natural Resources Committee last year on forest management. Your neighbor, and I'm sure Oregon's going to be very similar, Washington is only 1,283 times more effective at generating revenue per acre than the U.S. Forest Service. Idaho's only 917 times more effective at generating revenue per acre than the United States Forest Service. I'm sure Oregon's going to be right in that mix. Um, this came out earlier from an earlier report out of Nevada that uh, state-managed public lands average $6.29 per acre, positive net profit. Federal government loses $1.86. <laughs> we can't afford not to. Okay, so now let's get to the good part. What do we do about this? Where do we go from here? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you, you understand that there's a, an opportunity. You know, there are no easy answers, but there are simple ones. Just honor the same promise. If you're tweeting right, hashtag honor the promise. <coughs> Two, number two, transfer public lands. You know, hashtag transfer public lands. Just honor the same promise. That's a very simple problem. Not easy, but it's very simple. So here's what we did in Utah this year. Passed my bill in 2012. This year, I've got a transfer of public lands caucus in my legislature. I've got House and Senate members. We meet twice a week during the session. Tuesday and Thursday morning at 7 o'clock. We've got Kevin Stratton, who's an attorney. Uh, businessman is chairing the caucus. We've got House and Senate members, and we put together a whole slate of bills this year to begin implementing around four basic principles. I'll get those in just a second. But we've got jurisdiction that we talked about to start implementing jurisdiction and support counties in exercising jurisdiction. Continuing education on federalism. The, the, the first part that we went over today about knowing those basic fundamentals, we found that our attorneys literally cannot answer the question, is there anything reserved to the states to the exclusion of the federal government? And our state attorneys cannot answer that question. They can't, they can't identify a single thing. Remember, all things not delegated are reserved. Everything that's not delegated is reserved. Our attorneys representing us can't name a single thing. Did you fire them? Yeah, <laughs> right. We're going to work on teaching them. And so, um, so this bill, this was actually mine. This is the one bill on here that was mine. Um, actually, no, the concurrent res, well, no, yeah, that's, that was mine. The, the, the continuing education on federalism. So we're developing a course that, that every city, county, state agency, uh, attorney general's office, and legislative council has to designate at least one appointee to be the, the, the go-to person on federalism. And then we're developing a course. We've appropriated $30,000 to develop an online course that is, by the way, going to be open to the public and will be available for continuing legal education credit. So attorneys can opt in and get free continuing legal education credit. Wow. Wow. But it's, it's a course on the rights, powers, authority, jurisdiction of the states. So then we know that every one of our agencies, every one of our cities, every one of our counties, our attorney general's office, we know that they're charged with knowing what we went over this morning and more. 
knowing what the rights, authorities, jurisdiction, powers of the state are. That it's not supremacy, therefore you lose. We didn't even go over this morning. There's a Supreme Court case about 13 years ago that said the municipal authorities, the state and local government, form distinct and independent portions of the supremacy. No more subject to the general authority within its sphere than the general authority is subject to it within its sphere. That was the Supreme Court about 12 years ago, quoting Federalist 39, saying the states are supreme. Supreme. In everything that wasn't specifically delegated to the federal government. And yet what we hear, Wally, right? Supremacy, you lose, no matter what they say. Execute redheads on site. If, the, if that's a federal law, there's a problem. Well, I, I told you, I, I ran your bill by our legislative council. Oh, which one? The, this one? Your bill. No, your, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, this one, I think. And they said it was... They said it was not uh, lawful. It was oh, on the transfer of public lands? Transfer of public lands. Yeah, yeah, keeping the same promises is clearly unconstitutional. Yeah, yep, that makes sense, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, let's let um, the, A variety of different things. So we have a commission now that's going to work on sorting out those transition issues, and we appropriated $2 million to start preparing the legal case if the federal government refuses to work with us as a governing partner. We're moving forward. So, And other states are moving with us. So that's the same. Utah Wilderness Act. We did the first ever state wilderness act to say we're going to define wilderness on our terms. Are there areas that need to be protected? Absolutely. Are there areas that we want to go to and we don't want to see an oil rig in the middle of it or something? Absolutely. We're going to define that on our terms. So it's not a lock gate, you can't do search and rescue. It's not uh, you know these other things that, that, that actually work to the detriment of the land. Uh, interstate compact on the transfer of public lands. That's where we're inviting other states to begin to send delegates, where we start working on this issue together as states, because the issue is not left and right. The issue is centralized or local control. Right? That's the issue. We've been put into this left-right paradigm, Republican, Democrat, progressive, conservative, but the issue is, is centralized or local control, and we work on that together. So our governor signed these bills uh, recently. Now this is what I wanted to get to. But on, the, on the website, under the resources tab, there's a legislation tab. And so you can go find the legislation from all these other states. In fact, there's that Andrew Jackson thing down on the lower left. But you know, there's Montana, uh, Wyoming, Idaho, Nevada, all kinds of different stuff from Utah and whatnot. In April, uh, Herman, Senator Herman Ber Berchiger, is that right? Yeah, my close. Berchiger. Herman. Herman. In April, Herman, along with about 74 other legislative leaders, including Speaker of the House from Idaho, Utah Speaker of the House, Wyoming Speaker of the House, Senate leadership from other states, met in Salt Lake to do the Transfer of Public Lands Legislative Summit. Herman attended from Oregon, and it was wonderful. I got to tell you, it was wonderful to have him there. His perspective was so great. He said, "He said, you know, our situation in Oregon is a little bit different, but yeah, we understand." He said, "But as you can work forward, and we can help you work forward in Oregon to te to to teach and educate that this is the only solution big enough to fund education, better care for the environment, grow the economy. We get that moving in Oregon. It works everywhere." And uh, he was great. His perspective was wonderful, but. But, but out of that, we came away with four paths forward. This is for legislative leaders. The first is educate. You've got to get the message out. If people still think that uh, you know, your land is arid, therefore the federal government keeps it, um, you gave it up because you didn't understand property and self-governance, and you gave it up for the privilege of being a state, we have to disabuse them of this very false notion. The promises are the same. We've got to get that basic information out. So we're working on ways to educate as public officials. And, and that's critical. And so we, we're, we're working on a, a video right now where we put together these heart-wrenching stories. I mean, the one you saw at the beginning with NPR and Fox News about right here in Josephine County, that's one of the top candidates of, of the stories, the human interest stories that we want to put on the video. We're going to look, look at probably doing about six to eight human interest stories tied in with different leaders from around the western states telling various parts of the story moving forward. Promises are the same, it's already been done, it's the only solution big enough, knowledge and courage, right? So we're going to put that together in about a, a, a video that would play an hour on airtime, so about 45 minutes of runtime. It looks like we've got a $50,000 grant to start putting that together. We're going to probably need to raise about another you know, thirty dollars to $50,000 to make that happen. But then you've got a standardized tool that we can all use to put wherever we can place it on TV, we can chop that down into 90 second to 10 minute bites as well, and use that in every format with Twitter and Facebook and email and everything else that we can do, and we've standardized the message. We're working on that right now. Um, we should have the, the word on that grant next week to start working that forward. Other ways to educate, right? When you're a public official and you've got, and you've got hearings 
and you've got folks in front of you, what an opportunity to educate. What an opportunity to educate. When you're at national conferences, what an opportunity to educate. I can't tell you how many times I've been at a national conference and I've passed these out, and the folks east of Colorado said, I had no idea. And immediately they become allies. And you, you tell them the basic story, promises are the same, it's already been done, it's the only solution big enough, and you give them about 30 seconds of this, oh my gosh, how can I help? It's happening right now. So educate, number one, and then negotiate. Negotiate. When you have issues going on with the federal government, I mean, Paul, like your situation on search and rescue. So you hold hearings in your commission, and you come in and you put that on the table. Hey, health, safety, welfare is my jurisdiction. Can we all agree? The Supreme Court just said that two years ago. Health, safety, welfare is my jurisdiction, not the federal government. We'll all agree that what the Supreme Court said goes, right? Because the Supreme Court just said that two years ago. So we can agree on that, right? Health, safety, welfare is my jurisdiction in the county, not yours. And, and you put that on the table and say, okay, how do we deal with this? And you start working with your federal federal counterparts on situations that you're having on that. You pull them into a hearing if they will. If they won't, you document that. And if you won't, you do what Sheriff Gilbertson did, and you put letters out there that says, this is affecting the health, safety, welfare, and if you won't negotiate with us, I want the people of this state, of this county, of this nation to know that this be on your head. Because this is a situation affecting lives, liberties, and properties of the people. And, and, and so... You do it not in an antagonistic way, but you put these things out there and say, now, if I'm not missing something, the promises at statehood are the same. I mean, look at this. Oregon's Enabling Act and Illinois. And Oregon's Enabling Act in the Northwest Ordinance. And Oregon's Enabling Act in Kansas. And Oregon's in Wisconsin. And Oregon's in Indiana. And they're the same. Now, if I'm not missing something, why the difference here? Because if you were to transfer the land, this issue would go away. You see how in a negotiation, now you're talking about your search and rescue and being blocked from going out to rescue people, but you've got the opportunity to educate in such a deep way. So there, there are opportunities in negotiation to move this forward and to move that up the chain. Legislate, litigate. Legislate is what we're doing, right? We're all passing bills at different levels. Nevada's bill doesn't look like Utah's bill. Montana's bill doesn't look like Utah's bill. And yet, we're learning so much from what Nevada and Montana are doing. And again, these are blue states, guys. We're learning so much from what they're doing in how they're working that process and bringing people along and doing the logistical studies and doing this. We're learning a tremendous amount, which is why we went back and did additional legislation this year to incorporate what we're learning from these other states. But legislation starts to move that ball forward. Two years ago, everybody dismissed this out of hand. A week ago, there was an article in Forbes. Did anybody see the Forbes article? No? If you're not on the website, like the, like the, like the Facebook page. The American Lands Council Facebook page, we post stuff there every day. Wonderful article in Forbes. That I met with this guy for about an hour. He put all this information in this in this article in Forbes. It's in Washington Post. It's been, in, it's been all over the place. We're supposed to meet with the BBC on Tuesday. Um, you know, I mean, you, you saw it during the funny thing. I got on Glenn Beck and Fox News and Al Jazeera and you know, on and on and on. <laughs> Seriously, Al Jazeera. We talked about that. We thought, you know what? Our job is to get the message out. We're going to go tell our story anywhere they'll give us airtime. Right. So it's happening. That's moving. Um, and, then, and then litigate. Litigate. We, 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 we appropriated $2 million to start moving that forward. We're working on developing a, a legal advisory panel around the western states. So if you know of lawyers that are particularly interested and, 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 and want to be part of that legal advisory panel, there's so many issues to begin to develop. But those are the four points that we came out of that summit with as public officials. So now you, remember, your job is to hire and inspire leaders with the knowledge and courage to battle for, this is their job. Now what's your job? Let's look at that. Educate, number one. Get educated, educate others. And think about the world that you're in. The tools that you have to educate today, I think Benjamin Franklin would slap you across the face and neck if you did. You know, if you were here and he says, what, you're not on Facebook? You're not, you're not emailing, you're not on Twitter, you're not, you don't have your own YouTube channel, right? Could you imagine? Imagine Thomas Paine with a Twitter account. You know? I mean, they would be, because I mean, you can get to tens of thousands before you get out of your pajamas, seriously. We have tools to communicate that are a blessing to us. I know it's hard. I'm not really good at the whole Twitter thing yet. I kind of am. I'm not, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and email. I'm kind of working on the others. But what a great way to invest our time. Ray, I'm sure, Ray and Loma and, and any of your groups here, if, 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 if you were ready to step up 
they'd organize. I mean, anybody, Americans for Prosperity, Heritage Pack, there's so many other groups that will come in and do a seminar on how to get on Facebook and Twitter and all these other different things that are out there. Right? We've got opportunities to reach hundreds and thousands. You could be, in fact, somebody, who was it? Was it Carl? Carl was just telling me, he posted on Facebook and he's already got people going crazy. While he's sitting right here. Benjamin Franklin couldn't do that. Thomas Paine couldn't do that. Thomas Jefferson couldn't do that. You can. Educate. So get educated and educate others. Make yourself a promise. I mean, go on the website and share something every day or a couple times a week. You know, if you feel like you're wearing out your welcome, do it once a week. Pass something on. You know, pass it forward, share it. But you've got tools to do that in a way that's phenomenal. And you can grow that network and there are ways of doing that. So educate, get educated, educate others. Um, the second is donate. Donate money and manpower. Either or, or both, right? It's going to take, you know, the video to move things forward, to keep educating out, to train other people to get out and move so we, we magnify the message, right? Go on the website and if you can, you know, a hamburger and a Coke a month, just put that in there. I had somebody just last week, I don't even know where it came from, I gave a presentation, they logged on and became a gold member, $25,000, just said, I believe in this, we've got to move this forward. I mean, it's just... A year ago, I mean, a year ago, I was in the fetal position thinking, this is done. I don't know what I'm thinking. <laughs> this, I wish I was joking. Right? What, am I, what are we thinking? And my wife and I said, okay, we can go two more weeks, and then we're done. We just got to fold tent and go home. And just on sheer grace, things have been moving forward. Doors are opening. I'm going to show you some people opening doors here in just a second. If you can do a dinner and a movie a month, or, or, or a camera and a coke, do whatever you can do, if you can do that. If, if not, manpower, right? Get on, and you're going to have an opportunity. Do you have, we have those little cards? Do you guys all have your little three-by-five cards? Did they pass those out? Yeah. Yes. Okay, you're going to write on there what impressed you the most about what you heard today. If you want to get involved actively as a volunteer, please also on the back of that card, I know the sign-up sheet is over there to get on the email list, but separate from that, if you want to volunteer and get involved, please write your name and contact information on the back side of that card and give that to me personally. And I'll make sure I get back and get you on a volunteer list immediately to start working, okay? So on the back of that card, write your, write your, your contact information. On the other side, you're going to put what impressed you the most. So money and manpower. The final thing, and this is the big one, delegate. Deriving their just power strong. The consent of the government. That's us. That, the power is here. Our job is then to delegate that power to those who have the knowledge and courage to battle for, to hire and inspire leaders. How do we do that? I'm going to show you some cool things in just a second. So educate. You know, think of Benjamin Franklin with a YouTube channel. We, we've been, and um, it's tomorrow Sunday, and I told them I'm going to be preaching on Sunday. If they want me to speak on Sunday, they're going to get a little preachifying. <laughs> and uh, there's a little scripture that we caught on to, we've been living by forever. It's Revelation 3.8. He says, I've set before you an open door that no man can shut. You have little strength, but you've kept my word and not denied my name. And doors are opening all over the place. It's so incredible to see the way doors are opening this. And I'll show you something. But will you be the next person to open the next door? What door can you open? It won't be the same as the guy next to you, but the doors that you can open, it's phenomenal to see what's happening. So you've got, uh, you know, on the website, all kinds of information. Uh, the resources tab on the website, look at what we've got for you. You've got, you've got videos, all kinds of videos you can share, presentations like this, white papers, resolutions. And I'll, we'll look at that in just a second. Resolutions from all over school districts, chambers of commerce, farm bureaus, uh, counties, uh, all kinds of organizations have done resolutions. Any organization you're engaged in, you get them to do a resolution. You've now leveraged your one voice into a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand. In the case of the RNC, I'll show you, you leverage it into millions. Articles there, you can take articles and take those and shape them and do your own articles, legislations there. The candidate tab is really cool. So on the candidate tab, you've got all kinds of materials. These cards are there, you can print out these cards. The, the other cards that are there, um, we'll show you that. That's all on the website. The YouTube channel, there is so much video content on there. In fact, if you can help us start to to prioritize what you think the very best videos are. That would be something that would be extremely helpful. There's tons of information on there. Go like the Facebook page and get you know, all of your friends to do the same thing. 
that's actually old, we got way more in there than now, but like the Facebook page, it's such an easy way to, to communicate real time. Um, the, the, the Twitter account, get on that and follow that as well. I want to tell you about Lisa. Remember I told you she lost her horses? Lisa Galvez, this card is on the website. She called me the other day, she said she just flew to Florida to see her, uh, her daughter and her daughter was having a baby to see her new grandbaby. And, uh, she called me, she says, hey, I gave away 40 cards on the plane. <laughs> Good. On the plane, she was like, hey, did they you can't know get away from her. And then, and then as she's handed it to one, they're like, hey, I want to know what that is. Can I have one of those cards? No. I want Guys, people are so hungry for real answers. That's this right. is a real answer. And so in 10 seconds, she said, well, you know the promises to transfer that land are the same. It, 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 it shouldn't look like this because, quite frankly, it shouldn't look like this. And, and it's already been done. It's the only solution big enough. And go on that website and find out more information. Mm -hmm. She's probably given away, I don't know, three, four, five thousand of these cards. One person. One person. Um, Marty Halverson, I did a presentation like this, only a lot shorter, in Wyoming. And uh, she's a representative. She's also the Republican National Committee woman. And she said, hey, can I take a resolution to the RNC? What do you think about that? I'm like, man. It's a great idea. I never thought of it. And so she put together some language. We helped her clean it up. And, and one person, think of the door that she opened. The Republican National Committee has now unanimously passed a resolution supporting the transfer of public lands. Washington State GOP just did that a couple of weeks ago. County parties are doing this. Again, not a partisan issue. We don't endorse any party or candidate, but we'll take all of them that want to do this. These are things that are happening right now. By the way, it's a wonderful resolution to give you a good, quick overview in a couple of pages. There's resolutions from all over. You've got school districts and farm bureaus and a National Association of Counties in South Carolina, all sorts of people. Donate money and manpower. Bert and Kathy Smith, bless their hearts. If you've ever been to Utah and you've seen Smith and Edwards, it is the craziest store in the world. But uh, without them, we wouldn't have gotten off the ground. And, and counties, we've got counties here that, you know, these two counties have become gold members. They're putting in $25,000 a year because they understand you have to go on offense. These other counties here, they put in $5,000 a year to keep this moving forward. This is being driven by the local level, by counties and individuals and businesses and organizations doing whatever they can do moving this forward. You've got improvement districts and rural electrics and all kinds of other groups that are that are engaged in helping that. Individuals, all kinds of others. By the way, if you, there, there's still more of those thumb drives, and if you want to just do something today, they've got, she can help over there and credit cards and whatever to help do that. Delegate, hire and inspire leaders. Let me show you a couple people. So here's that candidate tab. You've got a really cool infographic that one of my colleagues in the house put together. Candidate questionnaire. You get out to candidates and get a questionnaire in front of, in every one of their hands. Hey, the promise is the same, it's already been done. Do you support this or not? Here's a resolution by the National Association of Counties, or our county party, or our county commission. Do you fully support this resolution? And if not, why? And on a scale of 1 to 10, how, how much do you support this? And then here's the key question. Not just do you support it, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? It's really easy to, you know, I mean, come on, candidates, right? If I'm, if I'm here and I want a job from you, and you all are going, hey, this lands thing, you're, oh, I support that, until I'm out of the door. But no, you've got to say, what specifically are you willing to do? Remember, educate, negotiate, legislate, litigate. What specifically are you willing to do? That's the key question. That's happening. In fact, I want to show you uh, right here. This is, this is uh, Senator Jennifer Fielder in Montana. Remember that blue to purple state of Montana? She got their legislation passed there, bipartisan support across the board. This was a meeting of all their congressional uh, candidates. Every single one of the Republican congressional candidates said, absolutely, I'm on board, I support the transfer of public lands in front of, you know, God and everybody. You know, all the people at that, at, that, uh, at that thing. Right here on the back of this card, let's look at that for just a second. I don't know where mine went. You got the card? I got the card on one of those. You got the, the bookmark card? Yeah. Here we go. Here we go. Thank you. So right on the back of this. You've got, you get in front of candidate meetings right now. You've got people that want a job from you. Think about that. You can go in and say, oh, that guy's got nice hair. I think I'll vote for him. <laughs> or you can say, you know what? There's a solution big enough to this problem, and you interview them. And here's a, can here's a job interview right there, right? Do, do, do you, will you fill out the questionnaire? Do you fully support whatever resolution? There's tons of resolutions on there. Just pick one. On a scale of 1 to 10, where are you at? What are you going to do to make this happen? 
It's happening. Let me show you. Let me show you how cool this is. Again, we're not, we're not dictating any of this. This is just happening because individuals are opening the next door. So Senator, and Senator Fielder went out and taught some people, and this is what the, I don't even know her name, I wish I did, but the chairman of the Flathead County Republican Women held it meet the candidates, and here's what happened. Oh, I guess I'm going to push the button over here. Association of Counties. They passed a resolution supporting the transfer of public lands. One guy opening doors. Uh, Rick Davis is a city manager in, in West Jordan, happens to be the city I live in. No public land. That city did a resolution supporting the transfer of public lands. South Jordan, no public land. Not only did they do a resolution supporting the transfer of public lands, they had it framed and matted and brought it to me up in the Capitol. It's hanging on my wall. It's, just, it's fabulous. But here's what, so this is uh, about five or six cities and four or five chambers of commerce. Here's what they said. We urge the continued petition of the federal government to honor Utah's compact of statehood, as they have to eastern states by disposing of public lands. The success enjoyed by other states in securing control of their lands was and is the product of a united front, an unequivocal determination to reject no as an answer. The eastern states succeeded in compelling Congress to transfer title of the public lands, and so should we. That represents probably about 600,000 people. Wow. You see how you can leverage your voice? That took a couple of meetings to meet with the leaders in that area. That represents probably 600,000 people. Right? I mean, that's, those are the kinds of doors that people are opening. Alan Gardner. Alan Gardner is a commissioner down in, in southwestern Utah. And uh, his county... Is, well, he's one of the counties that is, is a gold member of the American Lands Council. His county did a resolution, but guess what? Every city in his county, the school district, the Farm Bureau, their, their parties have done resolutions across the board. Because think about what you're doing when you invite someone to pass a resolution. You're, 
you're asking them to take action. We learn by doing so much more than by sitting here and hearing. I should have you doing jumping jacks or something while you're going. But it's, it's, just, it's just a law of nature. We learn more by doing. If you have to look at something and vote on it, now you've learned at a much deeper level. This is happening all over the West. So here's, uh, I'm going to give you a tool that summarizes the whole day that we've talked about in three minutes. Now again, if you were Benjamin Franklin today, you'd be thinking about what you could do with that tool. Right? And please, if you would on those cards, it's very, very helpful if you'd write on those cards, what impressed you the most about what you heard today? And again, if you would like to get actively involved and, and, and help as we start to engage in, in volunteers, please put your contact information on there. If you, if you simply want to just be on the email list, we do, some of you are getting the email already, right? We do, we do one email a week, we call it the three minute messenger. Yeah. We do one email a week, three minutes. Okay. We try to keep it very simple, give you some updated information. You can go as deep as you want after that. But if you want to be on the email list, that's over there. So this is three minutes that recaps everything we just talked about for the last uh, day. Some people say this movement for the transfer of our public lands is just about selling them off to rich back cats or that we can't afford to manage our own lands. The funny thing is the only people making these are the ones who want to continue to increase federal control over our lands. This is about a failed federal lands policy that is killing western communities, draining money right out of our kids' education, closing off recreation and grazing access, burning up western forests, and locking up trillions of dollars yep. in abundant natural resources in western yes. communities. Don't our children deserve the same opportunities to fund education, grow their economies as children east of Colorado do? This is about the only solution big enough to actually solve these problems, not lobby or litigate for greater federal control over our lands. Have you ever seen this map before? Mm -hmm. Most people ask, why the difference? Well, that's a great question. Because from the founding of our nation until 1976, Congress knew that it was obligated to transfer title to these public lands and statehood. In fact, in the statehood agreement, called an enabling act of every state, Congress reaffirmed that promise to transfer title to the public lands. So if the promise to transfer title to the public lands is the same, why the difference? In 1976, Congress came up with a policy to simply keep all these lands in federal ownership. Now there's a lot of problems with this policy, including the fact that the Supreme Court recently said unanimously that Congress doesn't have the authority to simply change the promises at statehood particularly where virtually all of a state's public lands are at stake. When Congress changed its lands policy, it promised to pay Western communities for not utilizing their lands and forests and other resources to fund education mm -hmm. and roads and other public yeah. services. Mm -hmm. Did you know that with so much land under federal control, some communities have less than 10% taxable land? Well, guess what? The federal government is broke here, and now it's reneging on these promises to Western communities to pay them for not utilizing their lands. It's shutting off even more access for recreation and grazing, locking up literally trillions of dollars in abundant natural resources in the West. Federal forest policies prevent harvesting any trees, even when they've been killed by beetle devastation. Yeah. This is causing raging wildfires, polluting the air, killing millions of animals, and devastating watershed for decades. Once Congress keeps its promise, federal public lands become state public lands, protecting access for recreation, and hunting and fishing and grazing and opening up access to our abundant natural resources to create jobs, fund education, and grow local, state, and national economies. Making Congress keep its obligation to transfer our public lands just like it already did with Hawaii and all states east of Colorado really is the only solution big enough. Today some billionaire is going to write a million dollar check to some extremist organization to keep yeah. you from accessing and using Amazing. your western lands. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Today, those same extremist organizations are going to file lawsuit after lawsuit, and then settle, creating new policy that shuts down your access and use to your Western lands. Today, some federal bureaucrat or agency is going to unroll a new policy that shuts off your access and use to your Western lands. Yeah. What are you going to do today? It's amazing. No. So think about where we've come today, right? It's a wonderful time to be alive. This is a yep. wonderful time to be alive. We, uh, we truly have been blessed with the opportunity to stand for something. For liberty and freedom and fairness and property, these are fundamental principles that are worth fighting for. So 
let us go forth with good cheer and stout hearts. Happy warriors out to seize back a country and a world of freedom. Thank you very much. Actually, we'd like to open it up for question and answer. Take about 20, 30 minutes to do that. Um, please, no long stories. Keep it short, sweet, and to the point. So, first in the back, and Mark's going to help me moderate. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a wonderful program to take it back to our sovereignty and grass But have you, and you will, Get the wrath of the IMF, World Bank, and New World Order. Um, yes, thank you for cursing me. <laughs> no, it's already happening. It's already happening. We've got all kinds of groups that uh, are trying to paint me as some kind of a demon and whatever. And, um, you know, I mean, that's, it's expected, right? But here's the beauty of it. I've just infected all of you. I've just cursed you. So it doesn't matter what happens to me, right? It doesn't, happen, it doesn't matter what happens to any one person. This is, this is disseminated. There's so many seeds scattered in the wind all over the West and beyond that uh, it really doesn't matter what happens to any one person or any one organization. And so now that opportunity is moving out. But yes, indeed, there, there is going to be a segment that is going to battle vigorously to maintain and increase centralized control. And uh, that's the opportunity we have before us. Yes, ma'am. That's a great question. So the question, in, in, in essence, is um, what if our state may end up being worse than the federal government? And uh, no, it's a great question, and we get that we get asked that quite a lot. Salem is a lot closer than Washington D.C. is, and again, there are no easy answers, but there are simple ones. And all of this is going to require getting in the game. This is not a spectator sport. And so, in terms of how we move forward, we've got to get in the trenches, in the battlefield of ideas and move forward. Now, if or when your state takes action that, that declares your, your, your ditch by uh, the waters of the United States or whatever it may be, you could do your tractor brigade on Salem. You, know, you could mobilize there. And, and you get a thousand people mobilized, 500 people mobilized on a capital, you get a lot, you get attention. Things happen. And you've got the ability to do that right here. Now, at the same time, what we've done in Utah is, in, in my bill, we've said federal public lands become state public lands for multiple use, sustained yield, with local planning. The resource management plans that have been done in all the counties that have been litigated forever, we're, we, we're going to honor those in that transfer to the state. But that's going to be something that Oregonians are going to decide for Oregon. I'm not going to decide that for Oregon. We've got different groups in different states working on how that works. And, and, and at the end of the day, it's going, to be, it's going to be a political process in how you sort those things out. But I would much rather put Oregon, Oregonians in charge of, of balancing the interests of environment and education and funding than having 528 people from Washington that you cannot elect or unelect no matter what. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you know, I have two questions. One of them is, um, I know it's like you were mentioning there are a couple of people who Great question. So, first question is, uh, what about some of our congressional delegation, particularly Mike Lee, and then what about uh, adversaries, and are we keeping a list of who they are and what the responses are? Uh, that, that summit, that legislative summit of Western legislative leaders, Mike Lee attended that and was uh, one of our key featured speakers. And Mike has been engaged from the very beginning in helping to frame the legislation and working with us on this. He's been, he's been great. So now it's a matter of working out and, and working with others. 
you have to understand that in Washington, the mindset is we need to grow power in Washington. And that affects anybody that drinks the water that goes there. And so it's not going to happen as a solution originating from Washington. It's going to happen as a solution that we push up and to Washington. That's why it's so great. I mean, this is happening from commissioners. Commissioners are driving state representatives, and state representatives are then driving governors. And, and you know, we're kind of right in that process, right? We've got commissioners have driven state representatives in a number of states. And now they're starting to focus on governors and attorney general, and then we start focusing the next line up the chain. And uh, you know, the more national representatives we get, people come out and, and move forward. That's all a matter of hiring, inspiring, and giving them knowledge and courage. As to your last point, um, yes, there's a lot of articles on the website on, on responses to hit pieces and whatnot. My wife is developing a database of answers and responses and things like that, too. So, so that, that's coming forward. Yes, sir. I, I have one very quick question. That, you know, I'm very pleased to respond to what you've been able to accomplish. And by the 31st of December this year, Utah has mandated the return of their land. Now, on the 31st of December, every day we see our Constitution and our laws being broken with impunity by the federal government. We see that every day. The 31st of December shows up, 31st of December 2014, they thumb their nose in Utah. What are you going to do? Great question. We get that all the time. So in the legislation that I passed, federal public lands become state public lands, multiple use, sustained yield, local planning, national parks off the table by our choice, congressionally designated wilderness, and monuments except for Escalante, we took those off the table. We're not, we're not seeking that. By our choice, we've decided to remember it's the states that cede jurisdiction to the federal government. By our choice, we made that choice after going this far down the road. In the bill, we also said that we want our, we call on our federal governing partner to work with us on an orderly transfer by December 31st, 2014. Quite frankly, they're not doing that. So we're not going to necessarily file a lawsuit on January 1st. We're going to file it on our timetable, but we've already appropriated $2 million. We've got a commission working on it. We're establishing a, a, a legal advisory panel around the Western states. And when we're ready to go in, we understand the liability case, right? But it's the remedy case. If you go into a judge and say, judge, look at this, we win. And he'll say, yes, what do you want? And we've got to be able to say, we want these specific things in the transfer, and here's how we're ready to deal with that. That's a very large process after 120 years. And so we're working on that process, working with other states. So it, it's, it, I can guarantee you it won't be January 1st, 2015, but it will be somewhere in that process. Uh, maybe it may take a year, it may take 18 months. But, but they've already told us, hey, we're not interested in having an orderly discussion and transfer. So fine, we're moving forward on our timetable. So your, your plan is to litigate. Yeah, litigate. Now, we still open legislation because the more states we're working with, the more power we have. So we still got all those options, educate, negotiate, legislate, litigate. And we don't care which one succeeds. But we're moving forward on all of them. And, and quite frankly, there's much more power in having more states on the litigation, particularly if we can get, you know, a, a, a Texas or a South Carolina. The more states we can get engaged in that, the more power there is moving forward. I will tell you quickly, I had, uh, last August, Justice Scalia was my warm up act in Bozeman, Montana. That's the way I'm going to tell the story. He was the keynote featured speaker, and I happened to be the speaker after lunch. And I got to spend about 10 minutes with him. And we're, we're standing there, and I showed him this map. And he said, is that really how bad it is? I said, yeah, Judge. He says, really? I said, yeah. He said, I had no idea it was that bad. I'm like, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and we talked about how it's, you know, these, these states were 90% federally controlled and they succeeded. He said, the federal government has no control of that land. they got to get rid of it. Three minutes with a U.S. Supreme Court justice. He said, they got no business owning that land. So, you know, one down, four to go. Right. <laughs> Um, you mentioned that Utah is going to define wilderness in order to placate or appease every single person in the state because each person has a different definition of what they consider wilderness. What criteria are you using to define wilderness and keeping all of the people in mind as to what they want wilderness to be? Yeah, so that's where we're at. So the question is, we have a Utah Wilderness Act. What criteria do we use to define wilderness when everyone's got different expectations? So you can see the bill's on the website. You can go up and pull the bill. But the idea is that we do it on a basically a common sense basis. 
they're protected lands. We still have access to deal with emergencies and whatever else. We haven't designated any land into that yet because the idea is when these lands come back, when the federal government transfers the land, then the representatives of the people will look at that and determine what lands we may want to preserve as wilderness. And that'll be an open public process that we've got to go through, right? So so it's that matter of being being closest to the people and moving forward. But 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 well, so what we're seeing is that is an interest that in our state, as representatives of the people within our state, that's an interest that needs to be reflected. And so that's what we're doing. Again, we're not in 1896. If we were in 1896, we'd sell off all the land, that was the deal. We're 120 years down that road as a public land state. There's a lot of strands of the spaghetti to sort out in that. So that's 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 what we made a decision. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And there's a candidate questionnaire on the website. People are posting those up. Yeah, Carl. Yeah, Ken, do you recommend, really, do you recommend that we start out with a single bill in the 15th session of the legislature? Just a single bill rather than a group of them? Yeah, so the question is, um, what, what would be the recommendation for Oregon in starting out? It, if, if I were in your state, first of all, I'd need to learn a lot more about your politics and dynamics, but if I were here, I would start to build bipartisan bridges wherever I could now. And so I'd start working on the education community particularly. I'd start working on um, the retired forest service people that understand that you know we can make toothpicks or we can burn down the forest and animals. And I'd start getting groups like that together that speak the language of protect the environment, educate, grow the economy, but I'd focus on these two. And I'd start building as many of those groups as I can now. And then what I'd probably do, and I would, I would recommend that you talk to Senator Fielder in Montana. She's the one that got the bill through Montana. Montana, what they did is they did a study commission to start looking at, at, at just the issues of federal lands. They didn't even talk about transfer of public lands. But what they then did in their commission, as they're talking about it, all the problems are coming out. And, and look at what's happening in communities. She did a survey, it was brilliant. By the way, the survey, I think the survey's on the website. She did a survey out to all the counties that have more than 15% federally controlled lands. And the surveys were unbelievable as they came back. Is air quality an issue because of the federal management? Off the charts, yes. What about access? Off the charts, it's being shut down. What about uh, economy? Is it affecting your economy? Off the charts, yes. What about invasive species? What about, and they went through this whole list of surveys. So now she's got something she can point to that says, these people elected on the ground are telling us, this is such a huge issue, we have to deal with this now. And so then she started having forest experts came in, come in. I came up and testified about what we're doing in Utah. The other states have come in to testify about what they're doing. And so that process of simply putting the questions on the table and letting people guide themselves to the answers, which is a, which is the way Nevada's kind of gone about it as well. I would recommend you get with uh, you know some of the people, Demar Dahl in Nevada, John Ellison. They've done a great job of, of kind of kind of helping to shape the discussion without predetermining the outcome. And, and a lot of people have been coming to that that outcome on their own. And so I would recommend that you kind of follow a lot that same, that same process. And folks, if you'll sign up too on the American Lands Council, uh, their sign up sheet, and also on the Solution Revolution sign up sheet, we will be doing calls to action. We will be doing continuing education. We're not going to drop it here. This is the beginning. And two very, very strong points I want to make about what Ken said is we've got to re-educate attorneys and we have to start grooming candidates to run because if we don't replace what's in there, we will keep getting the same thing. Also, we have the tables back here before you leave. I'll uh, support our sponsors. Ken's stuff is up front. Um, everything that you need from him is there. Please make yourself a member also so that you can stay informed with the three-minute manager. Um, I think, the, oh, there's a missing notebook. So if anybody comes across a black notebook, zipper binder, eight and a half by 11, if you'll turn it into us over here. Yeah, get some of those t-shirts. I don't want to take those home with me. They're really heavy. So, <laughs> are we doing more? But keep, I'll keep doing questions if you want, so. If they're um, willing to ask, you yes, bet. Uh, you alluded uh, earlier on about federal rights underneath the land. What's happening with that? Yeah. Okay, so the question is about mineral rights, and it's a wonderful question. 
what's happening with that in this. Step one is we, we simply make the statement legislatively that, that those rights transfer over. So federal public lands become state public lands, you transfer all those rights over. And then part of our stewardship on the commission of public lands is to then start sorting through how you, how you honor those rights as they come over, and that's part of what we're going to work on as we build this transition plan. Part of what we're working on going forward for the next year is kind of like a Utah flip -up. You know, the Utah Land Policy Management Act, where we incorporate all those various things at the state level um, without all of the real owners, burdens, and things, but then dealing with the same kind of issues on minerals that you were talking about. So that's kind of our next step, starting to sort that on a much deeper level on the transition. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, uh, I'm happy to repeat that. He said he wants to make a challenge to everybody that's still here. Uh, he's going to donate $100 and we challenge everybody else to do the same thing so that we can keep moving forward, working on the video and working on getting these other things moving forward. So, you know, I know we're all, uh, we're all doing the best we can and, and we've got demands everywhere we go. Um, you know, whatever you can do would be wonderful. Thank you so very much. That's very generous. Yes, sir. Yeah, all the uh, government regulation, if you look at what the laws are coming out of the EPA and all that, they're so onerous that there's no way you can hold on to them. Yeah, so the question is, is the laws, the regula regulations well, that are coming out? The ones, when, when the states get back the land, they're going to get hit still by the federal government with all the regulations. Unreasonable. Yeah, great, great, great question. So even if you get the lands transferred, you got federal regulations and things coming out of the EPA. You've probably seen in Wyoming, the EPA just in a regulatory edict took a million acres from the state of Wyoming and gave it to the reservation. Um, yeah, these are tremendous. This doesn't solve all the problems by any no, means. It's a good but, start. But once you have the lands in the state hands, you know they say possession is nine tenths of the law, right? Yeah. Once you have the lands in the hands of the state. Uh, and then the equal access to justice doesn't apply, so they can't recover fees by suing the state. Um, you've got a group of states that have now pushed back that much, and you've got other issues to deal with, like the EPA, like some of the Clean Water Action. Yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't solve all the problems, those are big issues to still deal with. Yes, sir. So, are the states going to dispose of the land if they get title of it? Okay, so the question is, will the states dispose of the land if they get entitled to it? That would be an issue that we anticipate would be decided in each, each state. In Utah, we're not taking that off the table. In fact, in the bill, the bill that I passed said, if we do sell land, 95% of the proceeds will go to the federal government, we'll keep five, that was the deal in the Enabling Act, and then we can begin taxing the land. So that kind of has a disincentive to sell the land. But there are certainly areas where you've got cities that are landlocked, you've got ranches that have inholdings of, of, uh, of BLM land or what have you. We haven't taken that off the table. One example that, that, that we're looking at in terms of how we would do this, if a city, for example, wanted to sell a park or wanted to sell a road, they can do that. It's hard, but they can do that. That's public land. They first have to have a hearing on whether or not they should vacate the public use. Then they have a totally separate hearing on whether or not the terms of sale are appropriate. We envision having the same kind of process so that if we sell land, it's not, you know, you're going to sell it off to your developer buddies or whatever that people want to, want to accuse uh, or you know, want, to, want, to, want to throw out as a, as a fear tactic. So in, in our case, we're going to develop this very open process. It's going to be a stringent process to get there, but, but we haven't taken that off the table by any means. But, but the problem with, with step one, I mean, you really have to where you're 100, in our case, 120 years as a public land state, in yours it's much more than that. You really have to work through and sort through that, that public use issue that is who we all are and what we've become, business and, and government and development around that process. And sorting that out is going to be a great job. So step one is federal public lands become state public lands. Yeah. The mineral, uh, the mineral estate, you're going to do a pass through. There's, going to, there's requirements in all the federal acts of disposition for mineral surveys, which, if you're not aware of, I'd like to have you know about that it needs to be done before you do any use change. In other words, you know, when your minerals are where you find them, you can't change that. You don't want to cover over that, that principal use of the land. And for people that want knowledge, I'd ask you to tell people at jeffersonmoneydistrict.com. 
and strictly related to law related subject matter. Right. And there's a highway and trail document that for keeping the roads open explains how the county is the main authority for that, not the federal government, all the way down to the trail. Right. So if they go to Jefferson Mining District, come and hit the highway uh, button. So JeffersonMiningDistrict.com and there's a highway button. Yeah, the mineral issue is a, is a huge issue. We have um, Representative uh, David Miller in Wyoming. He's a geologist into all sorts of things. He's, he's kind of our mining expert. I'm not going to tell you that I pretend to know all the ins and outs of that. But, but yes, we have people looking at that. So in this transition process now, those are some of the really complex issues that we have to work on and sort through. And, but the principle is we're going to carry those rights over and then we've got to work on how we, how we make that happen. Yeah, no, I look forward to having more information. Any other questions? Thank you so very much. I'm so honored that you have taken so much time. Now, now, if you have these little bars, please, you know, bring them